So the last little bit of electrochemistry that we want to talk about today is uh, something called electrolysis or an electrolytic cell. Uh, so we've looked at galvanic cells or voltaic cells, same thing, remember? Uh, and so when we have one of the cells, we're using a chemical change to create electrical energy. An electrolytic cell does just the opposite. We're using electrical energy in order to create a chemical change. Uh, in essence, what we have here is a rechargeable battery. Anytime, um, let's say you're using your phone, uh, where you turn your phone on and, and you get power, your battery is acting as a galvanic cell. Uh, it, you asked for power, the, your high energy uh, you know, lithium cell uh, has the electrons in the high potential energy side of the battery, and they go to the lower side of the battery and powers your phone. Now what happens when you, uh, your battery gets too low? Well, you plug it in. And when you plug it in, you are putting electricity back into the battery. And what you're doing is you're forcing that process to go in reverse. So you're using electrical energy from the wall in order to create a chemical change in your battery. So you're recharging your battery. Another way that we use electrolysis is to refine metals. Most of the metals that we get out of, uh, out of the ground is in the form of an ore, and we need to put them back from an oxidized state into a metallic state. And so we use electrolysis to do that. So with, uh, with both of these cases, whether we're refining metals or recharging batteries, we're forcing electrons to go in an opposite direction that they want to go, and to do that, we have to apply energy. It's really not any different than pushing a rock up a hill. If you don't apply that energy, the rock will want to roll down the hill, but in order to get it to the top of the hill, you have to apply constant energy until you get it to that point. So let's look at electrolytic cells. Uh, we do have some uh, differences with the galvanic cells. Uh, oxidation still occurs at the anode, reduction still occurs at the cathode. However, uh, the positive and negative signs of the two electrodes change. So in an electrolytic cell, your oxidation or your anode will have a positive charge or a positive sign, and your cathode, where reduction is taking place, will have the negative sign. So here's an example of our zinc-copper battery. Uh, we've got uh, our voltaic cell, our regular cell over here on the left, and we've got our electrolytic cell, cell over here on the right. So uh, electrons want to flow with a voltage of 1.1 volts going from the zinc to the copper. If I want them to go in the opposite direction, I have to provide a voltage source greater than 1.1 volts. In other words, it's, uh, it's just like rolling the ball up a hill. You have to provide a force greater than the force of gravity trying to pull that ball down the hill. You have to provide a force greater than that in order to make it go up the hill. Same idea. So with our, with our battery hooked up, we have the minus side here. So it forces electrons to go back that way as a source. Uh, the positive here will pull electrons out of that copper with a greater potential than what the copper is pulling with. So electrons get pulled up out of here and pushed down into here. So we force that reaction to go in reverse. Now we can calculate um, how much current gets passed through an electrolytic cell. So this is going to be more uh, for our... Um, uh, our metal uh, metal refinement process here. Uh, we can figure out how much current is going to pass through an electrolytic cell. And when we do that, we can then calculate how much material we can expect to be deposited. So uh, charge in coulombs is equal to the current in amps times the time in seconds. The time here must be in seconds because a coulomb is an amp second. Uh, once we know how much charge we've passed through a particular cell, we can use Faraday's constant to determine how many moles of electrons were used. Remember, Faraday's constant is 96,485 coulombs. That's per mole of electrons. So it's a conversion factor between moles of electrons and coulombs of charge. So if we take the coulombs of charge times Faraday's constant, or 1 over Faraday's constant, we get moles of electrons. From here, we can take a look at the number of electrons needed for reduction 
to calculate the amount of material deposited. This is going to be dependent on the charge on the metal ion. If we have a, a metal ion that has this one plus, then it'll take one mole of electrons per mole of metal. If it has a two plus, it'll take two moles of electrons to deposit a mole of metal. If it has a three plus, it'll take three moles, etc. You get the idea. We have to bring that charge down to zero in order to deposit metal ions as, uh, as metal atoms. So we have to use the charge for that. So here's an example with copper. Uh, copper is a very common metal that's deposited this way. So we're going to pass a current of 2.4 amps or amperes uh, through a solution containing copper 2 plus, and we're going to do that for 30 minutes. And we want to know what mass of copper is deposited in grams. Okay, the first thing we want to do is calculate the amount of charge. So remember to calculate charge, we have to take our uh, current times the time in seconds. Our time is given to us in minutes, so we have to convert that. So we have 30 minutes times 60 seconds per one minute, and we get 1,800 seconds. Okay, so we can take that value now and put it right there. So we have 2.4 amps times 1,800 seconds, and so we have charge total amount of charge of 4,320 coulombs. It sounds like a lot of charge until you look at it compared to Faraday's constant. So we're going to take that charge, compare it to Faraday's constant, and calculate the number of moles of electrons. So we have 4,320 coulombs times one mole of electrons per 96,485. And so you can see we actually have a very small fraction of coulombs, 0 0.0448 moles of electrons. Okay, from here, we're going to calculate uh, the moles of copper and then the mass of copper. We're just going to do that all in one shot. So we take our moles of electrons that we had right here, put it here. We multiply that by one mole of copper for every two moles of electrons. And the reason that's two moles of electrons is because of that two plus charge on that copper. Okay, if it was a three plus charge, then it would be three moles for every one mole of copper. Okay, but copper has a two plus here. So it's two moles of electrons for every mole of copper. And that'll give me uh, moles of copper because moles of electrons will cancel. So I'm gonna change my colors there. My moles of electrons will cancel. And then uh, that'll leave me with moles of copper. I can co then convert moles of copper to grams of copper using the molar mass of copper from the periodic table. My moles of copper cancel and it leaves me with grams. And I end up with 1.42 grams. So if I pass 2.4 amps through a solution, for 30 minutes, I will get 1.42 grams of copper deposited. Notice that the, the concentration of the copper solution doesn't matter. As long as it has at least 1.42 grams of copper in it, then that's how much I'll get.